Merry Christmas everyone and welcome to another pay-per-view review in the Reliving the War series. WWF Unforgiven In Your House took place on April 26th in the Greensboro Coliseum in North Carolina, a WCW stomping ground at the time. The event drew around 21,000 fans to the arena and 300,000 pay-per-view buys which was obviously down from WrestleMania 14 but doubled the last In Your House event, no way out. Our show's headlined by a WWF title match, Steve Austin vs Dude Love. Vince McMahon's gonna be sitting at ringside for that one. And we also have the first ever WWF Inferno match when The Undertaker battles his little brother Kane. Let's get started with our opening match, a six man tag pitting the Nation of Domination against Ken Shamrock, Steve Motherfucking Blackman and former Nation leader Farouk. The Rock's now the leader of the Nation of Domination and he's bringing D'Lo and Mark Henry to this fight at No Way Out. They have their hands full tonight with this team of hard hitting, no nonsense ass kickers and just look at these three absolute units. Blackman, Shamrock and Farouk give the Nation salute when they make it to the ring but Blackman has other things on his mind tonight. Jeff Jarrett's promised some live country music later at Unforgiven and this could mean the end of Steve motherfucking Blackman. Steve's lost his focus, he lets D'Lo shoulder tackle him at the beginning of the match and he takes takes a snap suplex after missing a spinning back kick, not good, not good at all. Steve-O snaps out of it with a drop kick followed by an arm drag and an arm bar before tagging in the world's most dangerous man and Dilo gets planted with a back elbow. Shamrock then delivers a rolling leg lock but Dilo makes it to the ropes and Shamrock goes to tag in Farouk. It looks like there's a communication problem and Farouk doesn't want to get tagged in yet but he enters the ring and Dilo has to face his old leader. Dilo thinks a cheap shot's the best course of action here but he ends up taking a spike Buster and Farouk then whips him like a government mule. D'Lo like gets lit up before Farouk performs a body slam and the whipping continues, much to the delight of fans in the Greensboro Coliseum. Steve Blackman enjoyed this so much that he got his mojo back. He tags back in and he hits a suplex and another arm drag takedown, but then Big Mark Henry comes in with the intent to end this motherfucking problem once and for all. Blackman gets clobbered before taking multiple backbreakers and a big clothesline sends Blackman to the canvas. D'Lo comes back in and unfortunately he's unable to keep momentum going for the nation. Steve hits him with a flying crossbody, he tags Farouk back in, D'Lo's able to soften Farouk up a bit and now The Rock wants a piece of Big Ron Simmons. The Rock lays it in while Farouk's been weakened, he hits a clothesline followed by a few boots on the mat but then he tags out again. It's clear Rock only wants to step in the ring when he's 100% sure his opponents can't fight back. We get Steve Blackman back inside the ropes and it's obvious that the country concert starts messing with his head. He takes a power slam from Mark Henry, a middle rope elbow drop from D'Lo, even The Rock comes back in to wreck Steve-O in the corner. When Blackman fights back, he gets put down again with a clothesline from the Intercontinental Champion. Blackman tries to steal it with an inside cradle but Rock kicks out and he makes the motherfucker pay with a people's elbow. To add insult to injury, Blackman gets put in a deadly chin lock, this is just hard to watch now. Steve gets a break when D'Lo misses a moonsault, Farouk gets the hot tag while D'Lo tags Rock back in, Farouk cleans house, the match breaks down with everyone fighting inside and outside the ring and it comes to an end when the ring clears out and Farouk's able to hit Rock with a dominator. The crowd pops for the finish so good job. It's a relatively safe six man tag and I'm not sure if Shamrock had an injury here because he didn't do a whole lot but it was still pretty good and the crowd enjoyed it too. After the bout Farouk says this is just the beginning of a long war, a war that's gonna see Farouk kick the Rock's ass week in and week out. Did you know that Ric Flair was apparently driving around the Greensboro Coliseum the night of WWF Unforgiven? Slick Rick was apparently talking to Jim Cornette and the WWF were very close to bringing Rick in and showing him on TV. Rick was recently fired from WCW and he was gonna stick it to Bischoff by showing up at a WWF pay per view event but according to Rick, his lawyer said it would be a bad idea and it didn't happen. Imagine if the Nature Boy even appeared in the audience though, that would have been quite the shot at WCW. Someone who is in the arena though is Stone Cold Steve Austin and Austin wants a word with the timekeeper Mark Eaton. On Raw this past week Dude Love defeated Steve Blackman when Blackman got put in an abdominal stretch. Steve didn't give up but the bell still rung. Vince McMahon was sitting at ringside providing commentary so it's believed that McMahon ordered Mark to ring the bell and end the match. Austin wants Mark to come clean and Mark says he rang the bell when he had to ring the bell. Stone Cold tells Mark to put some bass in his voice because he's 
he's starting to piss Austin off. Stone Cold says if McMahon tries to screw him tonight after Stone Cold beats his ass all around the arena, then he's gonna come after Mark. Mark has two choices here. If he doesn't screw Austin, he'll probably get fired by Vince, but at least then he could get another job. His other option is to screw Stone Cold, but it's gonna be difficult for Mark to find another life because Stone Cold will kill the poor bastard. Austin tells Mark to sit his scruffy ass down and think about it. If Dude Love beats Austin fair and square, then that's fine, but if Austin gets screwed, there's gonna be hell to pay. Next up, we have a European title match, Triple H vs Owen Hart. China's gonna be suspended in her own personal cage above the ring so she can't interfere in the bout. Triple H has remained one step ahead of the Blackheart and DX's leader was able to beat Owen at WrestleMania, so you gotta believe that this is Owen's last chance to win the title. Really, at this point, both men need to move on to something else anyway. China doesn't want to get in the cage, Sergeant Slaughter comes down to put her in, eventually China relents and Owen attacks Hunter from behind. The two have a fight at the entranceway and Hunter gets thrown into the side of the cage while Slaughter asks for it to be lifted up. Owen tells Hunter to suck it and he talks some smack to China before telling her to suck it too. The match gets in the ring and Owen sends Hunter out again with a clothesline. He waves bye bye to China as the cage gets lifted up and that cage is pretty high up. It reminds Jerry Lawler of the time he was elevated up in a cage and he ended up getting a nosebleed. As the match gets officially underway, we can see China trying to bend the bars, but she's having no luck. Owen gets floored with a hearty race knee and Triple H kicks and chokes his opponent in the corner. Owen takes a suplex, followed by a knee drop. Triple H then performs an inverted atomic drop, followed by a jumping clothesline, but Owen stays in it. Triple H then performs a dragon sleeper as China pulls out a little saw. She's gonna try to escape the cage by sawing her way through those bars, and I don't know, not sure if there's enough time for that. Unfortunately, we'll never find out because she drops the saw. Hunter kicks out of a sunset flip attempt and China's now trying to bend the bars. Owen rams his shoulder into the ring post and he takes the face breaker knee smash. China's still trying to bend those bars as Owen counters a reverse suplex with a German suplex. And what do you know, China has successfully bent the bars inside the cage. Owen doesn't realize it, he hits Triple H with a pile driver before delivering a top rope elbow, but then Owen sees China escaping and there's nothing he can do about it. Hunter gets hung up in the bottom and middle ropes as Owen goes out to China. The cage still hasn't lowered and China's now hanging on for dear life, likely praying that the guys in the back hurry up and fucking notice that she can't get down safely. She has to wrap her legs around the cage and Owen decides to get in the ring and continue the match. He hits a DDT on Triple H before applying the sharpshooter and finally the cage begins to lower. Owen releases the sharpshooter and we can see that the road dog lowered the cage but I still think they messed up the timing in this one, it looked a little sketchy for a moment. Slaughter and officials try to stop China from getting in the ring, Owen counters a pedigree with a slingshot and Owen performs a pedigree on Triple H but then X-Pac hits the ring and Owen gets taken out with a fire extinguisher, Triple H covers Owen and Hunter retains the European Championship. DX work together to keep the European title on Triple H and Owen Hart isn't happy. Michael Cole interviews Owen after the bout and he says the famous line, enough is enough. You wanna know what I gotta say? Enough is enough! Owen says he's had it up to here with all the bullshit and things are gonna have to change. Jim Cornette comes to the ring and he says the Greensboro fans are still the ugliest people he's ever seen in his life. And, J and Jim thinks there's some fans in the arena who still think the Rock and Roll Express is the best tag team in the world. Well, the homecoming's gonna get spoiled tonight. Every mother's nightmare and every schoolgirl's dream, Bastard Bob and Ballbag Bart, are gonna defeat Ricky and Robert tonight at Unforgiven. This match between the New Midnights and the Rock and Roll was unadvertised, but it's still as predictable as they come. The New Midnights we're never gonna lose this one. The NWA tag team titles were on the line and Ricky and Robert took the early advantage. I think someone thought the crowd would have been very much behind the Rock and Roll Express at Unforgiven, but they just didn't care at all. Tandem offense from Ricky and Robert kept the Rock and Roll in control and the Midnights even began shoving each other in the middle of the match. James E had to jump in and sort things out and the Midnights got back on the same page. The referee breaks things up when Bob helps Bart out during an abdominal stretch and this pisses is Cornette off. Tim White and Jim have an argument and this leads to Cornette getting in the ring and challenging White to a fight. This got a bigger pop than anything else in the match. Tim untucks his shirt and he puts his fists up and Cornette quickly runs away. 
The rock and roll lift Tim's hands in the air while Cornette puts his jacket back on inside out. Gotta say, I laughed at this, good stuff. Cornette ends up punching Ricky Morton on the outside, but he also accidentally elbow drops ball bag Bart in the middle of the ring. Still though, the Midnights end up winning when Bastard Bob hits Robert with a bulldog while Robert was covering Bart. Jim Ross says this was a nostalgia match and he hopes fans in the arena and at home enjoyed another tale from the rock and roll vs midnight rivalry, but this shit doesn't count. Sorry, but it's just hard for both new fans and old fans to get invested. It's time for the evening gown match, Sable vs Luna. This one has gotten quite a lot of promotion on Raw's War and it was used as a big selling point for the pay per view. Sable and Luna had been cutting promos for the past few weeks talking about the match and Sable said she doesn't care if she gets stripped, she's proud of her body and she only cares about getting her hands on Luna. Luna meanwhile thinks otherwise, Luna thinks this will be the ultimate humiliation and she repeats this in the pre-match interview backstage with Doc Hendricks. Sex sales ladies and gentlemen and the WWF were fully taking advantage of that fact. The promos leading up to the bout had one purpose, buy the show and you will likely see Sable in her underwear. So to win the match you gotta rip the evening gown off your opponent, I think we all know that. The match is under 3 minutes long and if you've never seen an evening gown match before, it's pretty much always the same. Some offense followed by attempts at ripping off clothes, the quality of the offense largely depends on who's in the ring of course, but basically you're gonna watch two women try to remove clothing for the majority of the match. Sable loses the bottom half pretty early on and just when she was getting the better of Luna, Marvelous Mark shows up. Mero distracts Sable and this allows Luna to win the match. Being the big sore loser she is, Sable ends up ripping the clothes off Luna anyway and the two ends up going under the ring. Sable re-emerges with Luna's underwear. Goldust covers Luna with his robe while Sable celebrates in the ring. Jim Ross says, now's the time to pause the video, absolutely wild. Jim Ross also said during Sable's entrance that you'd think Ric Flair just walked into the arena with the pop she got, quite interesting now knowing what we know about Flair waiting outside the building. Vince McMahon comes down to the ring and he repeats what he said on Raw, something catastrophic's gonna happen tonight at Unforgiven. Vince says there's speculation that he's gonna screw Stone Cold out of the championship tonight, but that's not true. Vince is here because he's a native North Carolinian, he was born in Pinehurst, North Carolina. And as far as this conspiracy theory is concerned, the very thought of that happening is beneath Vince's dignity, and he won't dignify the conspiracy with a response. He does say though he won't be held responsible for what happens tonight, he won't take any responsibility if Stone Cold screws Stone Cold. Our next match then is for the tag team titles, champions the New Age Outlaws vs LOD 2000. Quite simply, Road Dogg and Billy Gunn have outsmarted Hawk and Animal in every match they have had and we fully expect this one to be no different. Road Dogg says North Carolina basketball coach Dean Smith is here to support the Outlaws and Billy Gunn comes out with a blow up doll. These Outlaws seem to have loads of blow up dolls at their disposal, take from that what you will. Jim Ross says that Sonny's the WWF's answer to the Spice Girl as LOD make their way to the ring. It starts off with Animal and Billy Gunn and it's all Animal. Billy gets put on the mat multiple times and the Road Warrior has no issues at all when Road Dog comes in to help out his partner. Hawk takes over and he hits a par slam on Jesse James and Billy Gunn shouts oh shit as Hawk sends him up with a back body drop. Hawk then has trouble getting Billy up for a shoulder breaker but he gets it the second time around. Animal comes back in with a good old chin lock, he part slams Billy before the other two competitors jump in the ring and the LOD domination continues when the outlaws get thrown into each other. A doomsday device gets broken up by badass and I should mention here too that the move has been renamed to the devastation device. The outlaws finally get a chance to go on offense after some double teaming and we see a spinning toe hold from the road dog. The outlaws then focus on distracting the referee so they can cheat and it works out pretty well. Animal gets his leg wrapped around the ring post and this leads the Road Dog focusing more on that left knee. Billy and Road Dog tag in and out while focusing on the injured body part. We are building up to a hawk hot tag and before we get there we see a reverse leaping body guillotine from the Road Dog. Mr. James thought this was some exceptional work. Animal counters a Billy Gun pile driver with a back body drop and then he performs a dragon screw. Hawk then gets the tag and the Road Warrior fires up on both outlaws. The ring clears out and Hawk hits a top rope splash on the Road Dog, but then Billy Gunn hits him with a tag team belt. The fans think the match is all over, 
but Hog kicks out of the follow up pin and this one's gonna continue, the kick out got a good pop too. Road Dog then hits his own partner accidentally with the tag team belt and Animal performs a pinning German suplex. The referee counts to three and LOD 2000 are the new tag team champions, only they're not. The Fink announces that the new age outlaws are still champs. The commentators say that Animal's shoulders were on the mat during the pinfall, if you look at it though you can clearly see Hawk had his shoulder up but the referee didn't have a clear view when making the count. The outlaws may not have necessarily outsmarted LOD this time around but the outcome is the exact same. Hawk and Animal are left in the ring while Badass and James leave still holding the tag team belts. This match was just ok too, I think I've seen enough of LOD vs the outlaws though and it's time to move on just like Owen and Triple H. Fair play to referee Jack Doan though, he only goes and takes a dooms sorry a devastation device from the legion of doom, he has to get carried out on a stretcher as JR and the king debate the outcome of the match. Country music is Steve Blackman's weakness, his Achilles heel, his kryptonite. It's the one and only thing that can hurt the lethal weapon and tonight at Unforgiven, Jeff Jarrett has arranged a country music concert in hopes that it puts Steve in a coma, resulting in the end of his story WWF career. Steve has fought giant robot monsters and Tennessee Lee tried to take all the credit, but this was a forgivable sin in comparison to Double J playing fucking country music live on pay per view. Lee introduces Double J and Sawyer Brown of the stage and the death of Steve Blackman begins. Double J lip syncs the song Some Girls Do and I'm sorry guys, the way lead singer Mark Miller dances during the song just makes me laugh. I'm sure there's some Sawyer Brown fans out there who want to kill me but that shit's funny and his dancing doesn't really match up with the song. But what do I know about country music, he even pulls off the Double J strut so bonus points for that. This reminds me a lot of Double J singing with my baby tonight with the lip syncing and all that stuff and I will admit this is a catchy song. It was a billboard number one in 1992 and give these guys credit, they're still active after being founded in 1981. Still, Blackman's health meter must be slowly depleting as this thing continues on and we can only imagine Steve shriveled up in a corner, turning pale white while shaking uncontrollably. The, so the song ends and Double J thinks he's just ended Steve Blackman's life, but little did he know that Steve will rip the giant robot monster apart and he used its balls as giant ear defenders. Steve didn't hear a damn thing and he comes out to kick the shit out of Double J. Steve's okay guys, he's okay, thank god. Steve locks in the motherfucker lock as punishment for this attempted murder but T Lee smacks Blackman with a guitar and Jeff applies a figure 4. The crowd begins chanting we want flair when they see the figure Figure 4 and man, what a mistake it was not bringing Flair in on this night. Probably not a mistake in the eyes of Ric Flair but the pop would have been insane. Steve's been hurt but nowhere near as bad as what it could have been so that's a good thing, I'm sure he'll get some sweet revenge very very soon. The Inferno match is up next and Jerry Lawler's brought some marshmallows and wieners to the party. For the first time ever, a fire's gonna surround a WWF ring and to win the match you gotta set your opponent ablaze. It's The Undertaker vs Kane. Undertaker defeated Kane at WrestleMania but the rivalry continues on. On Raw this past week, Paul Bearer and Kane dug up the caskets of The Undertaker's parents. One got set on fire in the arena while Undertaker got chokeslammed into another. So things are heating up at Unforgiven. Eh, eh. Eh, uh, no, okay. This was a controlled inferno, not like that crazy shit you've seen on YouTube in Puerto Rico or that FMW match where it got so out of control that the competitors noped the fuck out and Sabu tried to put the flames out with buckets of water. This one's much more safe with the flames shooting up in the air after a big bump takes place. Some may not like it but I think it looks good on TV. It starts off with Kane stopping The Undertaker's early offense by throwing him into the corner but unlike WrestleMania, The Undertaker quickly regains control. Kane gets thrown to the opposite corner before the dead man performs old school and the crowd cheer when the flames shoot up for the very first time. Taker almost gets sent out of the ring but his head hits the turnbuckles instead. He then gets floored with a clothesline and you can tell it's hot in there just by The Undertaker's expression. Kane tries to shove Taker's face into the inferno and Taker gets dangerously close to the fire while in the corner. 
Kane then slams Taker's head to the mat before he tries once again to end the match, but Taker holds on and he shoves a thumb in Kane's eye. The two then take a moment to catch their breath, and it looks like Taker's struggling a little with the heat. God knows what it was like for Kane underneath that mask. Kane delivers a power slam before Paul Bear throws a chair in the ring. The Undertaker takes a shot right to the head, and Jim Ross says, Talk about Concussion City. Taker gets to his feet as Paul Bear wipes the sweat from his head. The flames constantly shoot up as Taker and Kane share strikes in the middle of the ring, and the commentators are really getting over the fact that the heat's unbearable. Even if it isn't as bad as what they say it is, they're still doing a good job of making it seem like it's very uncomfortable at ringside. Kane's taking the lead now, and Jerry Lawler says this is starting to seem a lot more like WrestleMania again. Taker gets a boot up in the corner though when he hits Kane with a kick to the midsection before delivering a Russian leg sweep. Taker then goes for a choke slam. Kane has the exact same idea, and it's Kane who's able to plant the Undertaker. Kane then goes for a tombstone, but Taker counters it, and it's Kane who ends up taking a choke slam. The big red machine sits right back up though, and the brothers take each other out with a double big boot. When the two get up, Taker tries his jumping clothesline, but Kane ducks and Taker comes very close to the fire. Kane goes to the top rope after delivering a sidewalk slam, but Taker smashes Kane's little demon on the top rope and Taker performs a superplex. Taker then throws Kane out of the ring and Paul Bear starts screaming at the Paro guy and Jerry Briscoe. Kane starts walking away from the ring, but Paul Bear's making sure that Taker can't escape by getting the fire raised when the Phenom comes close to the ropes. Kane thinks he's got an easy way out, but then Big Vader shows up to attack the Big Red Machine. We haven't seen Vader since No Way Out. Kane and Vader fight all the way back down the ringside, and Taker decides to jump over the top rope and onto both men. Paul hits Taker with a chair, but the dead man takes it away, and Kane gets whacked twice, allowing him to hit the floor, stick his arm under the ring, and get gimmicked up for the finish. Taker, meanwhile, stalks Paul up the entranceway, and the two end up on Jeff Jarrett's stage. Undertaker puts a bass drum over Paul's head, and the crowd pops when Taker signals for the end. He goes back down to Kane, and a big boot sends Kane into the apron, and the big red machine's arms on fire. He rushes back up the entranceway, where hopefully someone like X Pac has a fire extinguisher, and there you have it. The Undertaker wins the first ever WWF Inferno match. I know some people aren't fond of this bout, but I thought it looked cool as hell, and I thought it fit in very well to the Undertaker and Kane storyline. The action in the ring may not have been a 10 out of 10, but I like that the WWF tried something different here, and again, the vision of the fire surrounding the ring was great. In my opinion, this one's worth watching. Our main event features Stone Cold Steve Austin defending the WWF Championship against Dude Love. When the new DX formed, Cactus Jack and Chainsaw Charlie were the faction's first big casualties. Mick Foley got upset that fans chanted for Steve Austin while he and Terry Funk got annihilated inside a steel cage, and Foley felt the fans didn't appreciate the fact that he brought Cactus Jack back after everyone begged him to do so. When Steve Austin and Vince McMahon were booked to have a match on Raw, it was Dude Love who came to the ring to try and restore peace and understanding understanding to the war zone, but Raw ended that evening with Cactus Jack attacking Austin while Stone Cold had one arm tied behind his back. Austin believes this was a conspiracy and Vince McMahon was working alongside Dude Love the whole time, especially when it was announced that Dude Love was the number one contender just six days before Unforgiven. Austin's getting ready for Vince McMahon trying to screw him tonight just like Vince screwed Bret Hart at Survivor Series. And remember, Mr. McMahon has promised something catastrophic is gonna take place tonight at Unforgiven. The competitors make their way to the ring and the fans are indifferent to the heel dude love. Some fans want to cheer for him while others completely bought into the heel turn. When the glass shatters though, it's another great ovation for Stone Cold and the crowd goes nuts. There was no stopping Stone Cold in 1998. Dude Love strikes first, but Stone Cold quickly turns it around with some kicks in the corner followed by a back elbow that sends Dude Love out of the ring. Austin chases his opponent back inside the ropes where he performs the Luthez press, and after dropping an elbow, Stone Cold begins banging Foley's head off the canvas. Stone Cold performs an Alabama slam before dropping another elbow on Dude Love. Austin performs a leaping body guillotine as the rattlesnake stays aggressive in this main event match, and Foley takes one more elbow while draped over the apron. The Challenger decides it's not worth it and he tries to walk away, but Stone Cold brings him back to the ring, and Mick Foley really doesn't want to fight tonight. 
So Mick once again walks away from the ring and Austin's having none of it. This time Austin hits Dude Love from behind with a clothesline and just like The Undertaker and Paul Bear, these two are going to fight on Double J's stage. Stone Cold performs a body slam on Dude Love before throwing Mick off the stage with a hip toss and that had to hurt. You can hear Dude Love's body smack the ground upon impact. The challenger thinks he's getting a break after throwing Austin into the apron but Stone Cold instantly replies with a clothesline. The destruction of Dude Love continues with a double axe handle from the rattlesnake and the match gets back in the ring where Austin chokes Foley on the middle rope. Stone Cold misses another jumping body guillotine and this gives Dude a chance to pull off a bulldog. Mick then drops an elbow on Stone Cold and Dude's so messed up that he can't find his groove while trying to dance. Dude gets vicious in the corner as the audience chant Austin's name and the crowd successfully bring Austin back into the match. Austin hits another running clothesline but the comeback short lived when Dude Love nails the champion with a knee strike. As Foley applies a sleeper hold on the mat, we see Vince McMahon, Pat Patterson and Jerry Briscoe walking to the ring. Vince takes his seat at ringside and he sends his stooges back to Gorilla as Stone Cold fights out of the sleeper. Whatever Vince has planned here tonight, it can't be good. Austin notices Vince at ringside and the distraction allows Dude Love to try a schoolboy pin but Austin kicks out it too. Another clothesline sends Foley to the mat and Mick takes some damage when Stone Cold utilizes the ring post. On an instant replay we can see the timekeeper giving Vince McMahon a cheeky nod and this can only mean one thing, Austin's getting screwed tonight at this pay per view. Austin destroys Mick and the challenger falls out of the ring as Vince McMahon shakes his head. Austin says this next pile driver is for Vince but Dude Love counters it and McMahon likes what he sees. Dude Love manages to do more damage at the guardrail and McMahon decides to approach Austin. Vince taunts the WWF champion and this leads to Austin getting up and chasing McMahon up the ramp. But Dude Love attacks Stone Cold and Jim Ross thinks this little spot was premeditated. Ross is absolutely convinced that Dude Love and Vince McMahon are working together. Dude Love stops Austin from getting in the ring and once again Vince McMahon taunts Stone Cold on the outside. He tells Austin to be a man and get his ass up while telling the referee not to count Stone Cold out. Back in the ring Mick Foley applies an abdominal stretch, the same move Dude Love used when Steve motherfucking Blackman got screwed. Vince tells Mark to ring the bell but the timekeeper freezes and he won't do it. Maybe what Austin said earlier in the show made a lot of sense. Austin counters the move, Vince says do not ring the bell and the match continues on. On the outside Stone Cold suplexes Dude Love right on the corner of the ring steps and again there's no way moves like this didn't hurt. Vince is beside himself as things are starting to look pretty bleak for Mick Foley. Dude tries to escape through the audience but Austin gives chase and Foley gets sent back over the guardrail. Back in the ring though Dude Love manages to perform a swinging neckbreaker and then he warms up the band. It's time for sweet shin music. Austin grabs Foley's foot to block it but the referee gets taken out and we now have ourselves a problem. Mick Foley counters a stunner attempt with the mandible claw, Vince McMahon gets up to get a closer look but Stone Cold fights out and both men hit the mat. McMahon tries to revive the referee as Foley locks in the claw one more time but Mike Kyoto is completely out. So Austin backdrops Foley out of the ring and he grabs Vince McMahon's chair. McMahon tries to take it away but the boss is unsuccessful. Still though Austin gets the chair pushed in his face by Dude Love but he manages to fight Foley off by landing a few back elbows. Foley goes down, Austin grabs the chair but it's Vince McMahon that Stone Cold aims for and Vince gets wiped out. The crowd absolutely love this. Austin then hits Foley with a stunner inside the ring, the referee's still knocked out so Stone Cold counts the fall himself and Austin's theme music plays in the arena. Stone Cold celebrates, the crowd goes nuts but McMahon's still out cold along with the referee. Steve Austin walks back up the entranceway and Jerry Briscoe informs Hard Finkel that Dude Love has won the match via disqualification. It was the last thing Austin's enemies could have done really to get one over on the rattlesnake. The show ends with the EMTs putting Vince on a stretcher. Jim Ross says this is a very grave situation. The owner of WWF has been completely knocked out by the company's champion. 
I enjoyed the Unforgiven opener and I enjoyed the semi-main event. The WWF title match was alright too, but as mentioned on Reliving the War, the whole Dude Love vs Austin thing wasn't something that I personally enjoyed. The two still had a good enough match here, but it's far from Austin's best and it's far from Foley's best. Everything else at the show was absolutely skippable and once again I thought WCW had a better pay per view over the WWF's offering for this month. Spring Stampede was a better wrestling show from start to end, but Unforgiven does have its good moments too. There's a real shift in tone when it comes to WWF pay per views now and that's not a bad thing either. Attitude era pay per views have a lot more going on than just match after match and the WWF experiment a lot more moving forward. It proved too to be a very successful formula. WWF Unforgiven 1998 then, in my opinion, isn't great, but check out those matches I mentioned if you find yourself with some free time. Now go on and enjoy the rest of your Christmas day. We'll have another episode of Reliving the War before the end of the year, so I'll see you all next Thursday for episode 131. Thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed this one, and take care.